By the time of the Rosetta Stone, 196 BC, hieroglyphs were no longer in general use. They were used and understood only by the priests in the temples. 500 years later, even this restricted knowledge of how to read and write them had disappeared. The script of ancient Egypt was lost. The Rosetta Stone survived unread through 2,000 years of further foreign occupations. Romans, Byzantines, Persians, Muslim Arabs and Ottoman Turks all had stretches of rule in Egypt. At some point, the stone was moved from the temple at Sais in the Nile Delta, where we think it was first erected, to El Rashid, or the town of Rosetta as we now know it, about 40 miles away. Then, in 1798, Napoleon arrived. The French invasion was not only military, but intellectual. With the French army came scholars. Soldiers rebuilding fortifications in Rosetta dug up the stone, and the scholars knew immediately that they had found something of great significance. The French took the stone as a cultural trophy of war, but it never made it back to Paris. Pursued by Nelson, Napoleon was defeated, and in 1801, the terms of the Treaty of Alexandria, signed by the French, British and Egyptian generals, included the handing over of antiquities, and the Rosetta Stone was one of them. Most books will tell you that there are three languages on the Rosetta Stone. But if you look on the broken side, you can see that, in fact, there are four. Because there, stenciled on in English, you can read Captured by the British Army in 1801, presented by King George III. Nothing could make it clearer that if the text on the front of the stone is about the first European empire in Africa, Alexander the Great's, the finding of the stone stands at the beginning of another European adventure. The bitter rivalry between Britain and France for dominance in the Middle East and in Africa, which continued from Napoleon until the Second World War. We asked the Egyptian writer Adav Suef for her view of this history. So this stone so makes me think of how often Egypt has been the theatre of other people's battles. It's one of the earliest objects through which you can trace Western colonial interest in Egypt because, of course, it was found by the French in the context of Napoleon's invasion of the country and then appropriated by the British when they defeated him. And the French and the British argued over it, but no one seems to have considered that it belonged to neither of them. But Egypt's foreign rulers, from the Romans to the Turks to the British, have always made free with Egypt's heritage. Egypt, for 2,000 years, had foreign rulers. And in 52, much was made of the fact that Nasser was the first Egyptian ruler since the pharaohs. And I guess we've had two more since, although with uh, varying results. The stone was brought back to the British Museum and immediately put on display, in the public domain, freely available for every scholar in the world to see, and copies and transcriptions were published worldwide. European scholars now set about the task of understanding the mysterious hieroglyphic script. The Greek inscription was the one that every scholar could read and was therefore seen to be the key, but everybody was stuck. A brilliant English physicist and polymath, Thomas Young, correctly worked out that a group of hieroglyphs repeated several times on the Rosetta Stone wrote the sounds of a royal name, that of Ptolemy. It was a crucial first step. But Young hadn't quite cracked the code. A French scholar, Jean-François Champollion, then realised that not only the symbols for Ptolemy, but all the hieroglyphs, were both pictorial and phonetic. They recorded the sound of the Egyptian language. For example, on the last line of the hieroglyphic text on the stone, three signs spell out the sounds of the word for stone slab in Egyptian, ahai, and then a fourth sign gives a picture showing the stone as it would originally have looked, a square slab with a rounded top. So sound and picture work together. By 1822, Champollion had finally worked the whole thing out. From now on, the world could put words to the great objects, the statues and the monuments, the mummies and the papyri of ancient Egyptian civilization. By the time of the Rosetta Stone, Egypt had already been under Greek rule for over a hundred years, and the Ptolemy's dynasty would last for another 150. The dynasty ended infamously with the reign of Cleopatra VII. 
the Cleopatra, who beguiled and seduced both Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. But with the death of Antony and Cleopatra, Egypt was conquered by Augustus, whose image I'll be talking about later this week. And the Egypt of the Ptolemies became part of the Roman Empire. In the next programme, I'll be in Rome's great contemporary, China, looking at how the Han dynasty operated a superstate and expanded their frontiers while keeping close control over every aspect of society. All this through a lacquer cup. You can see the object described in this programme close up on the A History of the World website, as well as hundreds of others from museums across the UK. And if you have an object with a history to tell, why not add it to our growing collection? Find all this at bbc.co.uk slash a history of the world. <laughs>